So are we good? Okay. Um, yeah. uh, good afternoon. So, uh, first, I would like you to join me in taking refuge in cultivating the four immeasurables. Until I have reached full awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by means of beneficial actions such as generosity. May I attain enlightenment in order to benefit. Until I have reached full awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By means of beneficial actions such as generosity, may I attain enlightenment in order to benefit me. Until I have reached full awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By means of beneficial actions such as generosity, may I attain enlightenment in order to benefit me. May all beings find happiness in the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering in the cause of suffering. May they not be separated from the perfect happiness that is free from suffering. May they arrive in freedom and unity, free from attachment and aversion to those in their heart. May all beings find happiness in the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering in the cause of suffering. May they not be separated from the perfect happiness that is free from suffering. And may they not be great equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those in their heart. May all beings find happiness in the cause of happiness. May they not be in the suffering in the cause of suffering. May they not be separated from the perfect happiness that is free from suffering. May they abide in great equanimity. Free from attachment to my version to the most near. So, this is our uh, last and concluding kind of talk of this uh, uh, weekend here in Chicago. Uh, this afternoon, the topic is about the Buddhist path in general and how to actually uh, practice. So, it's more oriented towards kind of concrete advice and how is it that uh, you go about uh, being a Buddhist, <laughs> trying to uh, make progress on the path. So <clears throat> uh, the very, very first step, of course, with Buddhism, uh, is um, getting to know uh, about the Dharma. It means you can, of course, uh, um, you know, join a Buddhist group or uh, be of a Buddhist family or be in a Buddhist culture, but you won't really be able to practice unless you know uh, the teachings. As I explained to you earlier in our very first talk that essence of the Buddhist teachings lie in the uh, knowledge and uh, the realization and uh, for us to, so to speak, uh, become recipients of Buddhist teachings and uh, get a hold of these teachings, we need to get hold of the knowledge and the realization. But first step is uh, knowledge. Without the proper knowledge, you cannot, you won't know what is it you have to do, how to practice, and then, of course, you will not be able to uh, gain realization. So the very first step <coughs> as a Buddhist is uh, to learn about Buddhism. <clears throat> so this, of course, uh, there's many levels to this. So one, first, one can probably encounter Buddhism through uh, a few talks, through a few readings, and so forth. Uh, maybe this is why also some of us are here uh, and have met with Buddhism. Um, however, one shouldn't just uh, rely on those. One should try to really 
learn and study thoroughly. Uh, and for this, of course, uh, the help of uh, teachers and the help of uh, the great records of the Buddha's teachings and also uh, the explanations of his teachings, summaries and treatises that were written by uh, his disciples and also uh, later Buddhist uh, masters in history are very important and to be able to study those, learn those, is very important. So overall, uh, as I was saying earlier at the very first talk, the Buddhist path uh, has, so to speak, uh, an ultimate aim and a relative aim. Okay, so the ultimate aim is this attainment of awakening, and the relative or temporary aim is uh, improving our present condition. So in this sense, we said the Buddhist practice enables us to go from well-being to greater well-being and to ultimate <coughs> liberation from conditioned existence. Uh, so in this sense, uh, Buddhism main aim, ultimate aim is of course awakening, but the practice of Buddhism is not that it does not bring about well-being in our immediate condition. It does also. So one can reap benefits of this practice uh, in our immediate. So whether one focuses mainly towards awakening or one is mainly for, focused towards uh, cultivating through Buddhist practice just well-being, uh, immediate well-being for ourselves, all of this depends mainly on our own uh, how much we have ourselves matured, how much our matured meaning here, not that, not in our general sense like being an adult, but matured in the sense of to what degree do we have an understanding of reality, the teachings of the Buddha, uh, in that sense. Uh, so here, <clears throat> uh, maybe some of us are interested by this practice for the teachings of Buddha, just so that we can overcome the stress and difficulties that we have in life uh, and want to use it uh, for that purpose. And I think that to a certain degree, that's what uh, motivates the greatest number of uh, people. And so this is, uh, you could say, kind of the very first approach, the easiest approach uh, to Buddhism that follows more or less our general motivation of improving ourselves, of uh, finding well-being for ourselves. Um, but this uh, research for well-being is not seen just through uh, material gains, but on the basis of uh, wanting to follow the recommendations of the Buddha and resorting to uh, follow uh, Buddhist ethics, Buddhist uh, recommendations of not commit any negative actions, try not to harm other sentient beings. So if we follow that, as I said, we can assure ourselves in our future life you know, similar conditions or better conditions, and we will be able to create more harmony, well-being in our own life. So this type of motivation mm -hmm, uh, kind of uh, lays the ground for, uh, you could say, well, uh, very kind of fundamental Buddhist practice that, that doesn't aim towards awakening, but the aims towards uh, well-being in our uh, samsara. So there's a traditional kind of distinction we talk about in Tibetan, we say, nguanto mielik. Uh, and the term mento means improvement within samsara and uh, gaining a better situation within conditioned existence. Ngelik refers to uh, ultimate perfection, the uh, ultimate goal of awakening liberation from samsara. So Buddhist practice enables us to, teachings of the Buddha are beneficial for those two uh, to have access to those two 
kind of results, uh, immediate result and ultimate result. Uh, so the, for the first kind of approach, what is important is that uh, we understand to a certain degree uh, the distinction between wholesome and unwholesome actions. And it's basically, uh, you know, having uh, <clears throat> integrity, uh, moral integrity, uh, and uh, following uh, the Buddhist uh, code of conduct of not harming other sentient beings. One can also uh, practice meditation in this uh, context uh, to subdue our afflictive emotions and so forth. Uh, however, this uh, first basic path, uh, there, there is still a, what characterizes it is there's still an attachment to uh, this world, this life, to ha relative happiness. There's a hope for good health, wealth, uh, long life, uh, you know, uh, happy family, uh, happy conditions. There's still a hope for that. You're practicing Buddhist, you're, you're following Buddhist code of ethics because you uh, want to have a better life. You want your life to be better in general. Uh, you could, one could also say this is kind of the approach uh, you can, you don't necessarily have to be a Buddhist, you, you could say even, you know, it's just uh, you could say that actually that these teachings are valid uh, for everyone, uh, no matter what your uh, culture is. Uh, but what, so to speak, what, what distinguishes it from uh, other approaches is mainly that uh, trust in the fact that our actions, our behavior determines who we are and what we become. So if you, you kind of, uh, that, uh, you have to accept that, so to speak, or understand that and believe in that. If not, then, you know, why follow a certain discipline? <clears throat> you might think that your actions, your thought, your behavior has nothing to do with who you are, what you will become. Uh, and then there's no, actually there's a risk of no possibility of improvement. Uh, there's great, you're in a more dangerous situation, so to speak. So if you understand that point and you follow that ethics, although you have attachment, you can, attachment to this life, to well-being within samsara, you can uh, improve your uh, conditioning. By opposition, so to speak, with that approach, there's another approach, uh, which is a more profound approach, which entails that you understand what the Buddha taught concerning our conditioned existence, how this conditioned existence is actually characterized by dissatisfaction. So uh, that hope that you have for harmony, well-being, and peace is, is good, but it's not your main aim. You don't, uh, you're, you don't see that as your priority. Your priority is to become free of conditioned existence. You understand that even if you uh, are very wealthy, very powerful, in good health, very beautiful, have the best family, all that, uh, somehow, so what? It, it's just ephemeral. There's nothing truly reliable there. It's better than not having it probably, but still it, it entails all kinds of difficulties. It can also be an entrance to your uh, spiritual practice and progress. So uh, there is, uh, the second approach entails sort of, uh, now you could say a renunciation of samsara is one word that is used. You renounce samsara. But the, I think one has to precise, uh, give some precision to this 
because when you say in English, I renounce, it's like you're giving up something good you have. I renounce samsara. So I have samsara, something good I have, I have to give it up. Uh, that's not the idea. The idea is you have understood there's nothing good in samsara anyway. It's all characterized by dissatisfaction. So there's actually no interest in samsara. In whatever state within samsara is not attractive because it is... Uh, so you, you're, you're no longer kind of uh, misleading yourself and thinking that there is something great that you can get in samsara. You understand there's nothing great that you can get in samsara. Whatever samsara has to offer you is uh, uh, not only shallow, it's completely hollow. It's, a, uh, <clears throat> it's just an illusion. It's, a, uh, it's totally unreliable. It's a fleeting thing. So when you have that uh, understanding, then naturally there, there is really no, uh, no sort of interest and uh, desire to gain anything within samsara. Your only interest is to uh, be become free from all of this uh, confusion and look within your own mind and your interest is to actually actualize the true qualities of your mind. It truly becomes a priority. So this is where the actual path of awakening, so to speak, starts. Unless you have that, unless you have come to that kind of understanding and maturity, somehow uh, you're, you're not really on the path to awakening yet. You're not, the process of awakening hasn't really started because there's still, uh, you, you're, you're still kind of misleading yourself in hopes of something within samsara. And so your, your motivation is always uh, looking towards something within samsara, a position, a condition, uh, a situation uh, within samsara that you consider to be nice or good or favorable. There's always that hope that uh, remains and <clears throat> somehow even if you are practicing the Dharma, that hope kind of is uh, what is pushing you. So your practice kind of is uh, leading towards that. So mm, actually the Buddhist scriptures here they speak about these distinctions uh, on the basis of what they have termed as a vehicle or yana in Sanskrit. Uh, so your uh, basic understanding and uh, your understanding, your maturity, and more precisely your motivation is what uh, determines the yana you are on. For example, you might think, oh, I'm going to uh, the Bodhipath Center where we teach Mahayana, the greater vehicle. Uh, I'm a Mahayana practitioner. I'm a Buddhist, I'm a, I'm a Mahayana practitioner. We might say that. Whether we are really a Buddhist or really a Mahayana practitioner is not actually determined by the fact that you're coming to a Mahayana center and listening to Mahayana teachings and trying to do Mahayana practices. It really depends on uh, all of those teachings and those methods might eventually lead you to really become uh, or, or to uh, really become a Buddhist, really uh, start following the Mahayana. But it doesn't mean that because you, are, you know these people and you're going to these centers that you're on the Mahayana path. Whether you're on it or not depends, as I said, really on that uh, maturity that understanding and your sincere motivation, what you really are, uh, aspire towards, what you think. Uh, you know, we we uh, I talked about this word orientation this morning. You know, you think, oh, this is what is uh, right, and this is good, and. 
uh, it depends on that your how you orient yourself towards something think, oh that's the right thing and whether or not you follow that you might think oh finding goodness in in, in samsara is the good thing if you're oriented towards that that's what you you're interested in that and that's what you aspire to and you're oriented in that direction then you are on kind of on the path of still perpetuating samsara you're not really on the process of becoming awakened so the process of becoming awakened generally starts in your mind from the very moment where you see the dysfunctioning of your confusion and you see that everything within samsara or all the experiences on the basis of this dysfunctioning are not really uh, interesting uh, or not what you are striving towards yeah, that's when so to speak the path towards awakening uh, really thoroughly uh, starts and then on that basis uh, according to your you know, courage uh, you can develop uh, you can follow through with the bodhisattva path or not so the distinction with the mahayana or bodhisattva path with the common buddhist path common buddhist path or is really this disillusion of samsara i talked about this renunciation of samsara that we spoke about this is what uh, establishes the really in your mind stream there's a, a maturity a transformation that occurs that will lead you towards awakening and on that basis if you have uh, courage so what you have to understand here by courage is uh, mahayana path of course is an altruistic path uh, so as the buddhist path in general they're all altruistic they all teach uh, kindness and compassion but in the Mahayana context, it's taken to a much greater degree in the sense that uh, it becomes your priority uh, above you, the priority for you to seek your own awakening. And that is possible because of a distinction of not the fact of having or not affection for sentient beings, but on the basis of whether you have that type of courage or not to... Uh, to somehow put aside your own awakening and make the priority working for others, more principally. There's a, a story, uh, the image of Buddha gave that's quite interesting. He said, imagine you know, uh, uh, parents that have a child, and this child falls into a big pit full of rubbish that's extremely dirty, and he screams out for help. Both ch parents will run to their child, and maybe one of the parents will have the courage to jump into the pit full of rubbish to pull the child out, but the other will not. Uh, can you say that the parent that didn't jump into the pit loved his child less? No, he just didn't have the courage. It's not a distinction of having affection or not. There's a distinction of a question of courage. That means and being able to uh, you know, put at risk your own well-being to, uh, to help others. So this courage is what distinguishes uh, the uh, Bodhisattva path. That's why actually the practitioner of the Mahayana is called a Bodhisattva. Uh, the term uh, sattva uh, also <clears throat> indicates the notion of courage he the one who is courageous uh, in uh, aspiring to awakening meaning that he aspires to awakening not for himself only as a means to benefit others so there is uh, uh, that uh, distinction so basically uh, the the buddhist path the uh, is a single path. All of these different approaches uh, lead all to the ultimate state of awakening, complete and perfect awakening. However, uh, immediately, you know, the just said that the all these teachings somehow, somehow were taught by the Buddha. The Buddha was a very skillful teacher. Uh, for had he taught that you had to be altruistic to become awakened and give up your own hope for 
your own awakening and strive only for the benefit of other sentient beings, many would have not followed his teachings and many would have not had the chance to go towards awakening. So the Buddha taught in skillful ways so to give every individual opportunity to go towards awakening. So if you're still attached to samsara, you can improve your condition. That will be kind of a stepping stone once you reach that goal through which you can then uh, come to renounce samsara. Once you've come there, that will be a stepping stone for you to be able to uh, develop the bodhisattva path. And so these are all kind of like steps. Uh, of course, the bodhisattva's attitude, motivation, understanding is much greater, but it entails all the other understandings. So in this way, you know, although Buddhist organizations, traditions may see, seem different, have different approaches and so forth, they're not uh, different traditions like you would find in uh, the history of Christianity where you have two different groups that excommun excommunicated each other and created their own system and culture and so forth. Uh, all of the, uh, these approaches are... Um, uh, how to say, just for going from one more uh, kind of simple, uh, simple meaning here, uh, easily accessible approach to, to a deeper, uh, more subtle, uh, less easily accessible approach. But to come to the more deeper, subtle approach, you have to have mastered the preceding approaches. So it's uh, like steps, you know. Uh, the first step leads to the second step, and the second step entails that you have gone through the first step, that all the meaning and understanding and maturity of the first step has been acquired. Uh, so there is kind of a uh, progressive uh, path and approach uh, uh, like that. So this is just uh, kind of some general uh, points regarding uh, different Buddhist uh, approaches and practices. So here, when it comes to ourselves, one should really introspect and think. You know, it's not about, um, for example, you can choose to do uh, the Mahayana practice, recite sutras and whatnot, or do meditation. But if what deep down in your motivation is very self-centered and just looking for your own well-being, that practice, because of your motivation, will only lead towards what you are aiming. It will not lead towards awakening because that maturity is not present there. See, so here, if you want to practice, the most important point, as I said at the very beginning, is you have to start listening to the teachings, learning, studying, but not only that, you have to <coughs> reflect on those teachings reflect very carefully and try to see what does those teachings mean uh, and try to make sense of it uh, yourself you heard the teachings or you read the teachings you understood them properly then you have to reflect on it and uh, be sure of what you have heard and learned if you're sure of it uh, that means that somehow you have um, assimilated really those teachings and there is from that a certain degree of maturity uh, that will arise. And that uh, is what you will uh, then put into practice. And through your practice, you will uh, make progress in change and overcome uh, you know, all the negative consequences of your confusion and afflictive states of mind, karma, and so forth. So, <clears throat> concretely speaking, uh, now, what is it that we do? The very first step is uh, to become aware of uh, the very uh, unique and preciousness of the Buddha's teachings and uh, on that basis, 
if it is something you see as something very <coughs> precious, reliable, important, that will lead you to really want to engage in the Buddhist path. And this is kind of, uh, you could say officially or ceremonially marked by the fact of uh, a commitment, commitment of refuge. So this is the very first step. You would say that you enter the Buddhist path by taking refuge. Refuge is the very first of all Buddhist ordinations. And uh, uh, refuge is <clears throat> uh, something extremely uh, important uh, for it is having uh, awakening uh, as your goal, taking awakening as your goal and looking at that as your priority in life, uh, striving towards that. <coughs> Uh, so the idea here with a refuge is that uh, to a certain degree we, we understand the difficulties in our life, pain and suffering that we have in our life. And we can also, uh, ha ha if we have heard the teachings of the Buddha properly, we can understand that uh, life is characterized by dissatisfaction, by dukkha, uh, dukkha which is pain, dukkha which is impermanence, dukkha which is coextensive to conditioned existence, understanding the three forms of dukkha. And because of this, then uh, we want to become free of that and we see a state of awakening that the Buddha have a, had, uh, that the Buddha attained as that state of freedom from conditioned existence and wish to attain that. And uh, so that is, so this actually refuge, if we really, uh, proper refuge entails uh, also to a certain degree, this disillusion I spoke about, this renunciation of samsara I talked about earlier. So whether or not you can do that depends, of course, on your understanding. But anyway, the very basics is uh, sort of being kind of inspired by the, the Buddha, his teachings, Having, taking a real interest in this and kind of uh, <clears throat> making that interest very concrete, real in our life by uh, committing ourselves to uh, following the example of the Buddha, uh, taking the Buddha as our teacher, uh, uh, putting into practice his teachings, taking as our friends, more advanced uh, practitioners, so this is the idea of the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. So taking refuge in these, in these three. This is really the stepping stone, the first uh, kind of, uh, the first step towards awakening. So at this level, depending on your understanding, uh, you can uh, do this according to a more the Mahayana approach or more the just common Buddhist approach or more, you know, just a very beginner's approach looking just for greater well-being, uh, freeing yourself from suffering. So in any case, this term of refuge uh, is the idea of looking for something that protects us from all the difficulties uh, of life, of conditioned existence. So, for example, you know, if you're in the forest or in the mountains, you might find there a shelter that protects you, that you call a refuge. Now, similarly to that, uh, it is seeking this uh, shelter from which you can be free of uh, suffering and condition, suffering of conditioned existence. So, this um, shelter actually is ultimately the state of Buddha. And that shelter is not a paradise or someplace. It's just the innate qualities of our mind that we spoke about uh, earlier today. Uh, so you see refuge, although you are taking it externally in the three jewels, those three jewels, their qualities are actually innate qualities of our own mind. And they're kind of a mirror, if you want, to take refuge in those three jewels. Uh, so to 
kind of cultivate the inequalities within our own minds, three jewels that are present within our, in our own minds, within the qualities of our own mind. Uh, so this is really the, uh, the first step. Now, once you have uh, uh, taken refuge or taking refuge, let's say, entails a certain understanding of Buddhism. What is it that you have to understand? It is what I talked about the very first day. What is Buddhism? You know, what does it mean to be a Buddhist? You know, understand, uh, knowing the specificities of the Buddhist path, how uh, in the four seals, what is the Buddhist view properly, what is proper Buddhist meditation, proper Buddhist ethics, the, what is it, the aim, the goal, uh, awakening, how that is not just like a paradise or something, but really actualizing inequalities <coughs> of our mind, something that is very relate, uh, uh, real and relatable. So understanding that, I think, is uh, very important. And with this, uh, having an appreciation of what the three jewels are. What is the Buddha? What is it? What is awakening actually? What What are the teachings of the Buddha? Teachings of the Buddha are not some kind of invention, some kind of opinion about reality according to Buddhist teachings. It's just uh, a presentation of uh, the truth, how really things are. And uh, Buddha himself emphasized, for example, he said to his disciples that they shouldn't just follow his teachings by respect for towards him, but they had to put to test his teachings. And because they found his teachings to be true, that they should adopt them. So here there's really, this emphasis is very important in that Buddhism is not a kind of, a, you know, just a faith-based approach. Uh, just uh, believing in the, in the three jewels and uh, that alone will not make you progress towards awakening. You have to reflect on the teachings. You have to uh, find them to be true by yourself. Because you find them to be true, you can then uh, follow them. It's not just through the respect of the, towards the Buddha. So this is, a, uh, you know, it's a very, uh, you could say, uh, rational, uh, pragmatic uh, approach uh, so this is uh, very important so related to this you have you know, understanding the Buddha understanding the teachings of the Buddha uh, <clears throat> So the confidence, there's a sort of confidence in the three jewels that is gained. And this confidence arises mainly through understanding properly the teachings of the Buddha. So if you have studied the Buddha's teachings and you reflect upon them and you find them to be true, uh, because the Buddha's teachings are just teaching our reality, uh, you can look at the four seals or whatever the topics we talked about. Uh, there, there is really a sort of admiration for these teachings that will uh, arise because they are so accurate and so beneficial. It's not just a fact of being accurate. Whatever the Buddha taught is truly beneficial, helpful. So it's not like the truth that is a truth that is just true without a benefit to it. It is really uh, not only accurate, but it is uh, uh, truly a source of benefit. Knowing this, uh, the methods the Buddha have taught really do improve my life, uh, truly enable, benefit myself, may enable me also to benefit others. So there's something really uh, beneficial in the teachings of the Buddha. And if you see that there's a true uh, admiration. So here, sometimes we use the, the word of respect in the teachings, uh, respect for the teachings. Uh, so this respect, respect and deference doesn't come 
as you know respect and deference that you generally associate in our common language is towards something that is powerful uh, often you you see something uh, when you're in front of let's say a, a tyrant <laughs> or a powerful authority of some sort then you show yourself respectful and you bow down so he won't hit you or hurt you or something. You're like, oh, I'm very faithful to you and whatnot. It's not that type of respect we're talking about here. Often in religions like that, the God is almighty, all powerful, and he can hurt me or he can reward me. So I have to be very humble and bow down and respect to him so he likes me. This is not the type of respect at all in, in, um, in Buddhism. Uh, uh, the respect here is based on admiration. It's like, uh, it's more the sense of love, you know, as we would speak. It's like you, you see these teachings to be so true that you have a real genuine appreciation for them uh, in, uh, that you really admire them. And admiration uh, uh, is the real kind of deference. You see, uh, here it's that type of deference that uh, arises in our mind. It's a true admiration for these teachings that are so accurate. Because we know these teachings to be so accurate and so beneficial, we can from there deduce that the Buddha is a genuine uh, enlightened being. For example, uh, often in, in religions, you know, uh, the teaching is considered to be true because it was taught by a being that has been told to us to be true. And there's the almighty, all-powerful God, what he, he taught it, therefore it is true. Uh, but when we look at it, we are not allowed to question the teachings, <coughs> what has been taught. Sometimes it seems uncoherent, unco unlogical, or whatever, but we still have to accept them because they were taught by so-and-so great being that we are not allowed to question. You have, you have that kind of approach generally in, in many religions and traditions. Here it's completely different in the sense that we are allowed to question the teachings, put them to test. And once we have put them to test and questioned them, at the end of that, we found them to be true. We found them to be beneficial. And that is kind of a proof that the one who taught it knew what he was talking about. He is uh, truly, therefore, we can uh, deduce that he was awakened. So you see, there's the admiration for the truthfulness of the teachings. And from that, you gain the admiration for the uh, the uh, Buddha, the one who taught it, and trust that what he had realized is something really possible that is accessible to me. And also, therefore, uh, there will be confidence in the Sangha, uh, more advanced practitioners uh, who are <clears throat> closer than me towards to awakening and who can really be my friends and help me along the way, who can be reliable uh, friends that will not you know, lead me astray because they themselves are really uh, knowledgeable in these teachings and they have experience in it. So this is, uh, so to speak, what we have to try to develop. And uh, once we develop this uh, uh, kind of respect or you could say admiration more precisely towards the three jewels, then taking refuge uh, really makes, uh, is a, a very meaningful. This commitment is related to this uh, uh, admiration. <clears throat> now, in, in Buddhist practice, of course, we do many things like making offerings, uh, doing prostrations, uh, and things like that in association with uh, taking refuge and so forth. Here again, these actions are not at all like I was saying earlier. It's not about paying homage to someone that is more powerful than me, more mighty than me, to make him happy. All of these are methods or means 
for us to uh, to make actually the pursuit of awakening kind of our priority. Uh, to simply be put, you could ask yourself the question, how is it that right now I'm not yet awakened? Why is it that I'm not awakened, that I'm still here? You know? Well, for some, first of all, it's because uh, we never really knew about awakening and that we didn't take refuge in the three jewels. We took refuge in ego. We didn't take refuge in the quality of our mind. We take, took refuge in our confusion. When something, mm, how to say, uh, some adverse situation arose, we took refuge in anger. When we were confronted, when we perceived something uh, agreeable, nice, uh, we take a refuge in desire. That's what we have been doing so forth. And this reliance on ego and our affective emotions had, has maintained us here. It's kept us from uh, becoming awakened. Uh, <clears throat> also, we are here because uh, of our uh, attachment to our, to I and mine, basically, you know, to I and mine, and this desire and take refuge in these affective emotions, all this also based on the attachment to the idea of I and mine. So somehow all the di just different practices of, you know, uh, bowing to the three jewels or making offerings to the three jewels, all that are actually very skillful mean to remedy what has kept us right now from becoming awakened, up until now from becoming awakened. So uh, to remedy the fact that we have not known about refuge and we have taken refuge wrongly in the ego, we try to cultivate uh, admiration for the three jewels and uh, take refuge in them. Uh, we have been attached to I and mine so in order to overcome the attachment to the, to the I, uh, we, we uh, cultivate humility through the practice of, for example, making prostrations. This is a way of actually what we are doing is we are giving ourselves to the three jewels. By giving ourselves to the three jewels, what we are doing is we are giving ourselves to the innate qualities of our mind and no longer to ego. That's the idea. So it is a gesture of abandonment of uh, ego. That's why uh, that's the main symbol of, for example, making uh, prostrations. Uh, so it's the, somehow giving ourselves to the three jewels. If we give ourselves to the three jewels, we no longer belong to our illusion, our ego, we, ha we have to belong to awakening and do the deed and the work of awakening, which is altruistic, compassionate, unharmful to others and ourselves. Also, why is it that we haven't become awakening? The attachment to our own belonging because we want for I and so forth. So I, I, the practice of offering is also a way of uh, giving ourselves and what we have to dedicate it towards awakening. So what we have is not just our belongings, but also our merit. It's actually no longer trying to overcome the idea of mind, of attachment to mind. And so in that sense, uh, we practice you know, making offerings or the practice of generosity, giving to others. So here, of course, important point to, uh, to clarify with, uh, this offering, it's not like paying a tax. You know, like <laughs> I told you earlier about uh, deference, the difference between deference and admiration. We, you know, we show prostrating is a deference in the, it's expressing our admiration, giving up our ego to try to actualize within ourselves awakening. Whereas uh, making offering is also similar to that. It's not an act of 
taxes. It's not like I'm so attached to this, but I'm going to sacrifice this so uh, the Buddha will grant me with his blessings and make me successful in my life. Most religious practices of offerings are like that. If you look at previous time, they, <clears throat> they sacrificed even humans, sometimes animals, sometimes themselves. There were spiritual traditions where the practitioners would uh, die for their idol, for their god, or whatever. Uh, but each time in their, in their attitude is what they're giving up something that they're so attached to in order to be rewarded with something else. So there's not an abandonment actually of attachment there. This idea of sacrifice here, it's very different the idea of generosity in that a practice of generosity uh, is without the sense of, uh, of sacrifice or of giving a tax or giving something unwillingly or because I'm, or, or of doing a business, I'm going to get something else in return. It's simply the fact that understanding that there, there is no such thing as I, uh, as mine. There's no such thing as something that belongs to me. Truly, it's just a mental concept of things. And here, generosity is taking what we have and dedicating it uh, to uh, good deeds, uh, to Offering it to the Buddha is accomplishing their, their wishes for sentient beings. Giving it to others is trying to do something beneficial for others. So actually, the act of gen in the act of generosity, there is a sense of not of, uh, of sacrifice and of regret, but a sense of joy and appreciation of meaningfulness. So uh, it is said, for example, that uh, when we train in generosity, it's also important to train in the quality, not the quantity of what we give. For example, here, you may see that we place bowls full of water. It's not gold, it's not silver, it's not diamonds. It's just water. Why is it that we offer water? Uh, the, the Buddhas are not thirsty. They, and they don't need to drink. All these offerings are not because the Buddhas are poor and that they need all of this. It's, uh, it's for ourselves to train in, uh, in cultivating a uh, sense of abandonment of attachment to mine. But if we have to put all our gold in that, we might feel regret, we not, might not be doing it with joy. Whereas water, it comes out the tap, it's free. <laughs> There's no... Uh, no attachment whatsoever with it. We give it very uh, freely. So it is uh, what has been given with the joy is the real act of generosity. So the more you transcend the idea of I and mine, uh, the more you can give even uh, gold for someone like that, gold and, or water or stones makes no difference. There's no attachment to it. And so here it is a way of you, know, you use simple things like that to try to train, and then you associate it with your imagination. And there are a number of different forms of offering. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but the basic idea of it is to uh, transcend the idea of attachment to mind, which is one of the main hindrances that keep us within uh, samsara condition existence. And uh, uh, being able to develop uh, generosity uh, is also what gives rise to abundance, so to speak, or attachment, or, or uh, you, uh, what was, what's the word in English, or <clears throat> greed and uh, av avarice is what creates poverty, whereas generosity is what brings about abundance, uh, karmically speaking. So, there are many reasons why we do that. So this is uh, part of like kind of basic practices. So if you are, uh, whether you are, whatever level of practitioner you are, according to your capacity, your means, your circumstances, we do what we can. And all of this, what is underlying all of this is understanding of, you know, the 
the reliability of the Buddha's teachings, how they are you know, gener genuinely beneficial. And uh, there's admiration for these teachings. So this is very, I think, a, kind of a, a ground that we have to acquire uh, very much if we want our practice towards awakening to be something that really becomes meaningful and it's thorough. It's not just something uh, momentary. And sometimes you go to one center, you spend some time there, you're a little bit bored and you go somewhere else. And this is all kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like sort of like a tourism and entertainment and a distraction and whatnot. But actually, all of the, the settings and so forth are just structures where you can, that have to serve the teachings, places where you can learn and practice. But fundamentally, this practice is something you have to do yourself and that is beneficial for, for yourself. And if you don't, so to speak, uh, really have this, you know, understanding of the teachings of the Dharma, this admiration for Dharma, then your kind of relationship to the Dharma is very shallow. You can easily uh, not get really what the point is. So that's why I emphasize from the very beginning, you know, learning about the Dharma, truly understanding what is it the Buddha taught? What is so special about his teachings? Why is it so unique? Why is it truly reliable and true? Really think about that. And the more you think about that, the more you study the Dharma, the more you compare it maybe to other philosophies and ways of looking, more you'll find it to be so true, so beneficial, so uh, reliable. <clears throat> and as you practice it, this is what is also extraordinary, is as you practice what the Buddha taught, <clears throat> it doesn't become something theoretical. It's really uh, in your experience you see the benefits of the practice. Then your confidence is all the more greater, your admiration for the three jewels, all the more greater, and it reinforces your progress. So this is uh, uh, very important to, to, to study and get this sense of you know, understanding what the three jewels are, their qualities, and being able to develop true, genuine admiration. And this admiration sometimes is translated in English by faith. Okay, so in English, the word faith in our common uh, kind of usage of it means something very different. It means uh, to accept something without questioning it. Right? Here, it doesn't mean that. It means here admiration. And there are uh, <clears throat> This faith leads to, there are different aspects to this faith, let's say. One of the aspects of this faith is, as I said, you know, really the appreciation of the teachings, admiration of them. Uh, another aspect is because you, you have seen the qualities of awakening, you truly desire to attain awakening. There is a, uh, very strong motivation to become awakening that comes about. That's also part of the uh, the. Uh, so you see the truth of the teachings. You understand karmic causality. Uh, you understand the benefits of the teachings, and you have also the really strong aspiration to become awakened. Those are all related to what we would call. Uh, and the, you find the word translated in Buddhist texts as faith, they're referring to that, this admiration. And it's not to be understood as faith as we usually understand it. It's just, you know, kind of a, accepting something without questioning. It doesn't mean that. So then on, on this basis, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Kind of first step in practice is to uh, to kind of improve our conduct. So 
you know, you have to start with, let's say, avoiding what is the most negative. You, know, you can't immediately become perfect. You shouldn't think that as you have understood the Dharma and so forth, you'll immediately become awakened. You start wherever you are and you have to distinguish what are the most negative things that are to be abandoned, so to speak, first. You know, like, first um, is all the actions of violence, anger. Those are the most negative ones. Desire is not as negative as anger and hatred. So first working with that, working with uh, trying to uh, subdue the afflictive emotion of anger, understanding how negative it is. And although you cannot maybe completely subdue anger at first, you can working with emotion at first is more difficult. So what you have to be able to do is first work with your uh, conduct, physical, your behavior. You can, for example, make a commitment, take a vow never to kill, never to steal, all this kind of commitments. This is easy to do. And it's, it's not as easy to not get angry, but it's easy to not commit murder. You know? <laughs> You can get, you can, somebody might hurt you a lot and make you very, very upset. And if you don't have the vow to not murder, <laughs> you might, you know, and here killing is maybe, you know, murder is now a crime. It's very difficult. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's easy not to, it's very difficult to murder another human being, but it's easy to kill other animals. You know? He bit me right away. So I kill him. <laughs> Uh, for example. So this commitment must also go towards that, not killing, not taking life unnecessarily. You can make that type of commitment. Often we kill either through hatred, we also kill through desire, for example, food for the taste of flesh uh, or uh, for uh, gaining something from someone. So try to see how you can uh, reduce your negative your negative impact. So of course, the best and the easiest is to not uh, commit any murder, not kill any other human beings. But it is even better if you can try to avoid harming any other living being, any other sentient being. So in this way, you know, working with your improving your uh, conduct in life and this is not just with like that grave things but also stealing uh, these are simple things sexual misconduct or even within your speech every day so all of this practice has to be based on as I said mindfulness you know what are the ten non-virtuous actions what are their contrary ten virtuous actions and to be mindful of that and try not to harm. On the basis of not harming, then you can also try to benefit. So here, one of the important parts of the uh, practice is um, <clears throat> you have understood of the defects of condi conditioned existence for yourself but also understand that other sentient beings are also in that. And uh, one of the main aspects of Buddhist practice is uh, cultivating kindness and compassion towards other sentient beings. This is a, a fundamental practice of Buddhism. Uh, whatever the uh, yana you're on. So here, mm, it's important to understand first what we mean by loving kindness and compassion. So the term in Sanskrit is metri, or loving kindness. Uh, this is to be distinguished, for example, uh, from uh, desire. Now, often people think, oh, I love someone. But it, it, when it's self-centered that love it's more consumption like people say oh uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I love chicken. That means they took a chicken, killed him, ate, boiled him, and put him on the plate. I love chicken. Ended up in that word, I love chicken, is actually expression of such uh, disdain for that animal. And often in our relationships, a lot of what we call love is like that. Well, I love you. Is it like I love chicken? <laughs> you know? uh, then, you know, people are a little bit confused with that. That's desire. That's self-centered. It's not uh, kind of uh, understanding, respecting others. So <clears throat> here, uh, what is actually love? It's important to understand this from the Buddhist perspective. Uh, it is true appreciation of others. Uh, this appreciation means that you have, um, uh, it is a, a sense of, you, you like others, and there's a sense of joy accompanied with it. For example, uh, there, there is basically kind of two aspects to this. One is the you could see the say the feeling, and because of the feeling, there is uh, uh, an intention, a type of intention you have towards others. So the feeling is a feeling of uh, joy, of appreciation, liking someone. Uh, for example, uh, the example that is given in the scriptures is. Imagine a mother or a father that hasn't seen his child for a very long time and sees his child. The first kind of feeling that arises when he sees him is a sense of joy, or appreciation. That's uh, love. You're happy to see him. You, you're, you like him. There's a sense of joy. And that a joy leads to a certain type of intention towards that person, which is you want to see that person happy because you like him. You know, you will, you will make an effort. You will do whatever it takes to make him happy. You're ready to, because you love him, you're ready to give a gift to him, ready to be generous to him, to give up for yourself, uh, put him before you. All, you know, there's uh, somehow this... Uh, Affliction has the consequences. It puts your concerns for yourself behind the concerns you have for the other. The happiness of the other is more important. You will go through whatever effort, whatever difficulty to make that person happy. Seeing that person happy, smiling, joyful, brings you such joy and happiness. See, that's uh, what is, kind of, so to speak, metri, uh, affection. <clears throat> then, mm -hmm. if you have that, then it's possible to have compassion. Without that, compassion is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. If compassion does arise, Nevertheless, it entails always this affection. They're, they're inseparable. Without love, you don't have compassion. So what is compassion? How is it different from this metri or love that we talked about? Uh, compassion is, imagine, okay, I'll take the traditional example. Imagine a parent that hasn't seen a child in a long time, she finds her child full of joy and learns her child is very ill, you know, and is in pain, because of this love, seeing that person in pain, profoundly uh, touches you. You, are, you cannot be indifferent towards the difficulty and pain that person is in. It profoundly uh, touches you, and you are ready to do whatever it, it takes to help that person overcome that suffering and free him from that. You see how compassion is somehow impossible without love. So then if you have that 
so here you see it to, to look at it similarly to what we saw earlier, there's like two aspects to it. One aspect is the feeling. <coughs> the feeling is all the distress that you feel seeing the suffering of others. And the intention that follows that is to help that person come out of all that suffering, make him free of that. You see, that's uh, compassion. So these two qualities are extremely uh, important. Uh, it's what we try to cultivate because if we have this sense of affection <clears throat> towards others, we will not harm them. We will always try to benefit them. If we have the sense of compassion. We will also, uh, if we have this sense of affection, then we will have naturally compassion seeing other sentient beings in difficulty. And we will be able to, how to say, put aside our own comfort, our own well-being uh, to go and help others. We will, one can wonder, why is it that we don't go out and help others? It's because uh, it's not easy. It, will, it, it might cost us our time, our effort, our difficulty, and we don't want to make that effort. If you have that compassion, you will not look at what it costs us. You do that uh, without thinking, without hesitation, with joy. Because it's something that is so meaningful towards you, for you, I'm sorry. So, uh, love and uh, compassion are very important uh, qualities that we try to uh, cultivate. And this is also the stepping stone, so to speak, for the, uh, or the, the foundation for entering into the path of the bodhisattvas. Because we have this uh, kindness and compassion, we try to make that kindness and compassion uh, limitless in the sense that we try to uh, have that love and compassion towards all beings without exception. So for example, uh, you could think of that, you know, first of all, towards your own family or towards your own friends. Uh, you can use these teachings just in your everyday life. Like maybe you have difficulties in your own relation, in your own family. Are you, do you really have affection for your family members or not? Or is it just, the type of love that is desire I told you about earlier, like with chicken or fish. You know? uh, is it that type of love or not? But I say, oh, then that's not the proper type of love, you know, truly appreciating it. If you're able to have that attitude, it would transform your relationship with your family, your other family member, you immediately create more harmony within your family. And the great, the great power of love is that if you really have that, you inspire that in others. And you benefit greatly from it, as well as you lead other people to have those qualities, and they will also benefit from it. You know, how, creating peace in the world, uh, creating harmony in the world, uh, well, starts within our own mind, within our own attitude. If we are able to have a kind, compassionate attitude, this will reflect in our immediate surroundings with the people we are with. So at least, you know, even if we are not a great Mayana practitioner, if we can just already have this towards a certain number of sentient beings, then try to extend that eventually to more beings. Uh, and eventually, if you can have that towards all sentient beings, without exception, then you are kind of ready towards uh, following the Mahayana path. And here the Mahayana path aims at attaining awakening for the sake of all sentient beings. So this is called, this intention is called bodhicitta, the enlightened, um, or you could say, uh, the spirit of awakening, or the intent of awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. So this is something that is much spoken about. This is what 
uh, is very important uh, within our lineage, our tradition. So for example, I spoke briefly, introduced you briefly about the nature of mind, the profound teachings on meditation, on Maha Mudra, but to be kind of a proper recipient for these teachings, it is required for us to engage into a number of preliminary practices. Uh, these teachings are not given freely. You're not allowed, to, so to speak, to receive these teachings unless you have really done properly the preliminary practices. And the reason for these preliminary practices is none other than changing our kind of self-centered, egotistical attitude into an altruistic attitude and being able to give rise to bodhicitta truly. Unless we have done that, then we, all of these other teachings will not make much sense, will not be really meaningful. You will not be able to really apply them or get much out of them. So to really be a recipient for the teachings of a great vehicle, and particularly the teachings of Mahamudra, our motivation must be such that other people benefit of all other sentient beings is more important than our own benefit. You know, truly be able to develop an attitude of kindness. So there's, this is a whole process of training that's very important in our lineage and tradition that we, uh, from the very start, try to cultivate you know, genuine love and try to bring it to be, become universal. So there's a number of reflections, thoughts, considerations, uh, thinking about this always, trying to develop this attitude every day is considered extremely important. And eventually there will be a time where even in our sleep, in our dreams, we'll be more concerned about others than ourselves. And this comes about, this means that truly we have started to train properly in this uh, attitude. And then if we develop bodhicitta properly, this altruistic attitude properly, then we, then all these profound teachings on the true nature of mind will, will be able to really understand them. If not, I, give, I, I explain you these things, these words, these kind of concepts, you don't really, you won't see them in your experience for true or be able to actualize them uh, completely. So really to be able to do that, the concrete way to start, and to put it into practice is by uh, cultivating a bodhicitta on the basis of cultivating universal love and you know, compassion. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is done in our tradition through what we know as the preliminary practices. Uh, so there are different ways of doing the preliminary practices, but fundamentally they concern the what we call the common preliminaries, which are related to uh, the topic I spoke to you about, that is uh, being disillusioned with conditioned existence, uh, renouncing samsara, in other words also. And then uh, the special preliminaries, which are related to uh, cultivating bodhicitta, overcoming all the uh, negative dispositions in our mind stream or negative karma, uh, and cultivating wholesome, uh, attitudes, uh, uh, developing um, you know, through our generosity, through, for example, practices of offering and so forth, um, creating abundance and the favorable circumstances to be able to truly completely comprehend the teachings. And then there is one aspect of the teachings and the preliminary practice is very important, which is the cultivation of devotion. So here, uh, devotion is a devotion or faith is related to that topic I spoke to you about, of admiration of the three jewels, remember? Uh, when talking about the Buddha Dharma. So uh, in our tradition, so to speak, the, the lineage holder, uh, our principal teacher who pinpoints to us the true nature of mind and brings us to realize that is the, so to speak, the embodiment of the three jewels. And what he has done for us by enabling us to recognize the true nature of mind is something, uh, a gift that is 
incomparable, or that gift is what enables us to understand, uh, have understand, of course, our nature, our mind, but have access, therefore, to awakening and freedom from conditioned existence. So it is uh, the greatest gift ever, so to speak. Uh, so I uh, hear uh, it is using that very admiration as a, uh, as a path, that admiration uh, towards the teacher, the three jewels, uh, is, uh, will bring about what is called blessing. So this is another term that we use, blessing, which is uh, meaning that this admiration will bring us to transcend some of, somehow our dualistic clinging and be able to have access through the, uh, this kind of, you could say, you know, it's kind of a little bit emotional. You're full of admiration. Uh, as admiration is such for this quality of awakening that you have recognized and seen that your own uh, attachment to the self and dualistic clinging subsides. And through the admiration, the actual natural innate qualities of your mind become apparent. So you see this, uh, both compassion and admiration, these are all methods of, of both have something in common in that they both enable us to overcome self-centeredness that we talked about and being in, caught in that dualistic clinging of I and other. So these are all very powerful methods uh, through which we can come to understand the uh, true nature of mind. And <clears throat> then traditionally, uh, on this basis of having done the preliminary practices and uh, uh, through the, our admiration, being able to recognize the true nature of mind, which you would call uh, receiving the blessing, uh, we uh, then will cultivate that recognition of the nature of mind through meditative practice. And then the, the path itself uh, is, you know, uh, presented, or for example, in a certain way in the Mahamudra uh, teachings, the more common uh, Mahayana teachings, they, they go together. It's just different, different ways of uh, looking at the path. But basically, we speak of uh, there's a progressive path of all the different levels of realization uh, through which one ultimately comes to complete and perfect awakening. So I won't go into the detail of that, but that is kind of uh, a summary. At least you have here some key points of how to you know, concretely uh, undertake your practice. So the, the practice is, of course, uh, learning, and in, uh, you know, uh, learning, reflecting, meditating, putting it into practice. Uh, it also entails, uh, you know, your understanding, right? understanding of those teachings, uh, and also your con conduct. So, uh, practice is not something you do somewhere only during. Uh, limited period of time, something that you try to integrate continuously in every moment in your life. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not like just doing a 21-day uh, gym challenge of some sort. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a lifelong commitment. So, maybe you have uh, questions regarding uh, all these different points, please feel free to, to ask. There are several, mm -hmm. several online questions. <laughs> please. Um, three so far. Uh, the first one is. Um, Regarding the example of a parent jumping mm -hmm. in to save the child, mm -hmm. about love and courage, mm -hmm. I recall you saying earlier that having fear is due to being connected to ego. 
Does having courage mean you have to let go of ego? <clears throat> uh, the courage is a truth. Yes, so to a certain extent, extent is being concerned more by others than yourself. And that uh, it's not just being more concerned by others, it's also the fact that um, you're willing to risk, put to risk your, your well-being for the sake of others. Yes. Uh, in addition to reflecting on dukkha, mm -hmm. are there practices to develop and strengthen renunciation? <clears throat> um, well, considering dukkha is, I think, a very important part, but also understanding how our mind functions, how all of this is, how, how we are misleading ourselves, how we are confused and misleading, misleading ourselves. Uh, that's, I think, very, uh, uh, that's very important for, uh, for renouncing samsara because you understand samsara to be confusion. Not just dukkha, also confusion. They both go together, of course. For example, you can see a dream to be a painful dream, a nightmare, uh, and you could want a happy dream instead. Uh, and and you, you might realize that the happy dream is still unhappy uh, and therefore not want to dream anymore. But you can also see that a dream is just a dream as such as an illusion and is always unhappy also. Regarding compassion, how to be compassionate towards oneself. For example, there is a lot of talk in the world about me time and taking time for oneself, especially with how life can be so crazy for people with work, taking care of family, traffic, needing to cook, sleep, etc. Does taking time for oneself go against being a bodhisattva? Is taking time for oneself just reinforcing the ego? Well, I think you have to start uh, <clears throat> Uh, wherever you are and uh, as a beginner it's important to take time to learn if you don't make you know progress uh, if you don't acquire uh, understanding and knowledge of the Dharma and you're not able to practice and think if you, you don't come to the conclusion it's really important for me to become more compassionate and so forth then you'll never really be able to become more compassionate. Just saying you have to become more compassionate is not enough. You have to really uh, come to that conclusion yourself and see it's really important. So sometimes that in, entails you have to take time for yourself uh, and that will, be able, that will enable you to then afterwards uh, be more effective and more compassionate in your everyday life. So, so to speak, being altruistic uh, is the best thing you can do for yourself. You know, it's, it's true compassion towards yourself too. Being egotistical is the worst thing you can do for yourself. Other questions? It's another one. Mm -hmm. Siddhartha left his family before embarking on his quest for enlightenment. Monks and nuns today are celibate. Mm -hmm. Is enlightenment possible while also being a parent? Yes, there are, there, 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 are, uh, there are stories of practitioners who are able to uh, integrate practice in their life, although they were uh, in the world, uh, either as a parent or someone working. Uh, so it is, it is possible but it can be for certain people more difficult. It all depends on your own capacities and dispositions and your, uh, uh, your chance or not to have understood certain teachings and your ability to put them into practice. Like 
actually being celibate is something that is not that difficult uh, in, uh, in the scale of all the different practices. It's considered one of the easy ones. You know? uh, uh, however, to not be, to be mindful 24 hours, never be distracted, never give rise to anger, all those things are considered uh, much more difficult than being uh, a celibate, for example. Uh, yet, uh, whether you can put that into practice as, or, or not, that depends on yourself and your own capacities and also whether or not you've received the teachings, you understand them, you know how to do it or not. So basically, you know, you can practice no matter what circumstance, what condition, whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you are a celibate monk or nun, whether you are just a lay person, whether you are working, whether you are retired, there are ways uh, of integrating practice in your life in every situation. And you can be successful in every situation. There's a story like that once of uh, one <clears throat> uh, Buddhist master. He was a great scholar, and uh, he was he was traveling, and he came by a farm where there was an old farmer. And all he had ever done in his life, this farmer, was to farm. And he asked this master to teach him about uh, practice meditation. And the master taught him, but he couldn't understand. He said, teach me something simple that I can, he said, what, you know, what, is you, what, what do you do in your job? He says, well, I, I plow the earth to, uh, uh, to grow crops. And so he taught him a method where using his, uh, his tools uh, and uh, using that as a point of focus of meditation that he could uh, practice and cultivate uh, at the same time uh, shamatha and vipassana. Okay. So uh, that old man then took to heart those teachings and practice and eventually he through that uh, gained great realization and uh, he thought oh I must go in our uh, he, he gained clairvoyance and uh, uh, great powers also through his practice. And then he wondered where his teacher was and he wanted to go and uh, express his gratitude to his teacher. So he appeared to his teacher, uh, he came to his teacher, but in an invisible form. And he said, thank you to his teacher. He said, the teacher didn't remember him. He's so many disciples, thousands of disciples, a famous master in India. I don't remember you, who are you? And he said, well, I'm this old farmer. You one day taught how to meditate while I was plowing. He said, oh, remind me, what instructions did I give you? I don't even remember. And then he, he told him the instructions that had been given him. And he said, oh, and he received those instructions again from his disciple who was realized, then realized how he had been so distracted by his activity of teaching. And then he himself practiced the teachings he had given to his <laughs> Uh, disciple uh, uh, accomplish realization. So uh, you see, there are stories like that. For example, of the great Mahasiddhas, who were uh, often some of them were kings, some of them were poor people, some of them were uh, just ordinary people who did different type of works and were able to integrate the practice uh, through special instructions and. Uh, come to realization. So no matter you know, what your circumstance is, where you are, you can uh, make progress. But I think the key point here is, you know, you have to, some of these great masters probably, they were already, uh, they, they already had great merit, capacity to understand easily these teachings and so forth. So if you don't have that to remedy this, we do the practice of the preliminaries and you know to developing this altruistic attitude and uh, making our minds so to speak mature to be able to understand these uh, more profound uh, teachings and then after all the teachings of the all these masters have been recorded we have them and they're preserved we 
speak and study them, learn them, and then put them into practice according, accordingly. The essence of the practice is, you know, your, your mind has to become the master of itself. It can overcome its confusion. Uh, any other questions? I'm sorry. Oops. No questions? <laughs> well then, thank you very much for your attention and it was a pleasure to be with you for this uh, weekend. I hope that uh, <clears throat> this was beneficial for you. It was, I hope it was clear and I hope that we will have the opportunity in the near future to meet again. And I encourage you all to uh, continue on your path and to deepen your understanding of the Dharma. And I pray and wish that you may all uh, make great progress and uh, on the path and ultimately attain awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. And I would like you to join me in dedicating merit or our progress and merit we have uh, made in this time together so that this merit may uh, benefit all beings and our progress towards awakening so that we may become ultimately a source of uh, well-being for all sentient beings without exception. Through this merit, may I attain true omniscience, then have and overcome our harmful destructive forces May I liberate sentient beings from the ocean of existence in its turbulent waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. May the most precious mind of awakening that has not yet gone, now arise, and the wisdom may it never be the mind that can continue to increase that mind. May the most precious mind of awakening that has not yet gone, now arise, and the wisdom may it never be the may it continue to increase that mind. May the most precious mind of awakening that has not yet gone now arise, once arisen, may it never decline, may it continue to increase evermore.